All right, so my name is Jorge. I work at Google. Um, and it's interest, it is obviously not, ran, not uh, co uh, coincidence that the stocks were scheduled this way. I'm going to be covering a lot of stuff about namespaces. I think I'm more on James' camp. I think user namespaces are mostly OK. Uh, I'm not super worried about them. We are not super worried about them at Google either. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Minijo, which, which is a tool that we wrote at, at Google to do sandboxing. Um, all sorts of sandboxing, we kind of try to make a tool that we'll be able uh, to use for kind of anything that the Linux kernel grew, we try to add it to Minijo uh, and make it work. Um, we use it on Chrome OS. We use it on Android. Uh, we use it on server side. We use it for build farms. We use it for fuzzing. We pretty much use it everywhere, which is interesting because it gives us a good idea of how people like to use uh, sandboxing and how to make things easier for people to use. The reason we wrote Minigel was because if you run this command in the laptop that you're using right now, it's probably, if you have a, a Linux laptop, it's probably going to look something like this. Um, if you have a Mac OS laptop, you can run it and it works. Uh, do people mind closing the doors? There's a lot of noise from outside. Um, it's going to look something like this. And the red there is obviously because red is bad, root is bad. Why is root bad? Because Bluetooth D is listening on the network. Uh, it's listening on the radio, right? So there's essentially one bug that's separating any random attacker next, close enough to your laptop to use to uh, like, uh, uh, attack its radio to compromise Bluetooth D and use root privileges to uh, just load a kernel module, right? On, Linux, on most Linux systems, root equals kernel load, module loading, and that equals kernel code execution. So we're one bug away in Bluetooth D's code base, which I don't know if you guys trust it. I'm not picking Bluetooth D. There's a lot of red in there, so we could put anything in there. Um, but these code bases are not necessarily super robust, right? Any of those processes are listening on the network on auto radio. And there's one bug away from essentially just fully compromising the systems. And this is, this is the uh, Linux workstation that I use day to day. It's running a super modern kernel, but it still looks like this. And why does it look like this? Well, it's basically because we have kind of misaligned incentives, right? Uh, there's, on the one hand, the admins that put, like, put together a distro don't really know what permissions the software needs, uh, and the devs that write the software don't really know the environment in which their software is going to run, so they kind of really make assumptions about how much sandboxing or privilege dropping they can make. Uh, so it's always a little complicated to, I guess, be sure of what exact, like, what environment you can assume and use that to, like, draw privileges, right? So that's the result. The result is that things look like this. And you're one bug away from being completely owned, which is not cool. Um, if there's any sort of privileged access on that machine, well, it's not completely crazy to think that I could just set up a beacon right here in this room with, and just exploit everybody's vulnerable Bluetooth stacks. That would, that would be super easy to do. Um, I have not, that, not done that, just to be clear. Um, but we are in a situation in which the person that writes the software is not the person that runs the software, so we need a way to bridge these things. And the other problem that we have, at least that we found, is that sometimes developers will try to use the privilege dropping mechanisms that are provided by the Linux kernel, but they might do it wrong. Why? Because there's so many pitfalls that can happen, right? In this case, somebody tried to write a switch user function that will drop root, but what did they do? they forgot to check the result of the state UID function. Which, if you're in security, this is like, oh, they're super noobs, they didn't know this. But like, it doesn't matter what we think we are better than everybody else. It matters that this software is out there, and we want to fix it, right? So what's the problem here? The way to explo exploit this is cause the state UID call to fail. The program will still run with root privileges, and then it will exploit another bug that's in the process. But that, will, instead of exploiting a pro program that's running as a non-root user, you will exploit a program that's running as a root user. The right way to do this is if set UID fails, you abort the program, right? So you only say where to do it. And 
This process also tries to set up capabilities and it mostly succeeds, but it requires, I have omitted the 15 plus lines that you require to set capabilities using almost any interface available today because it's just so tedious and like possibly it's more likely that you're gonna introduce a bug when it takes 15 plus lines to set up capabilities than if it just takes three. And this is what we did with Minigel. Minigel is about not reinventing the wheel. We don't want every single developer writing Chrome OS system so software or Android system software to have to understand all the intricacies of, of dropping privileges using Linux kernels. We want them to have a single library or executable that they can use to just do the right thing easily. The easier it is for developers to do the right thing, the more often they will do it. So by using Minigel, we turn the 15 plus lines of setting capabilities to like one or three because of formatting. Um, and Minigel is unit tested, integration tested. It's, not, it's never gonna forget to check the result of state UID call, right? So this is good. This means that we have one single library that does privilege dropping code, which is obviously a security critical piece of code. That's good. We can test it. We can unit test it. We can integration test it. We can make sure that it always works. Um, but eventually, I guess, some people on the team realized that we were like maybe 85% there to building real containers, the kinds of containers that people have been talking about today, Jeremy were talking about, and um, Robert was talking about earlier. So we took Minigel all the way, and Minigel is essentially undermining this, which many people might not realize what it is, but this is an Android app, and this is Chrome OS. Um, so Minigel is essentially underlying this new technology that, we, that Google added to Chrome OS, which allows you to run Android applications natively with no, and no sorts of like emulation or virtualization or anything. There's just an Android system running inside a container. Um, things are plumbed in and out correctly so that essentially this works. You can click, you can have your plants spit your zombies uh, on Chrome OS without breaking most of the security guarantees of Chrome OS like a verified boot. So how do we do it? Well, we build this thing called Minigel, which is a sandboxing slash containment helper that we use on Android, on Chrome OS, on Umbrello, which is uh, an Android-related project that Google's building for IoT, for, for it, the Internet of Things. And it essentially allows you to do many of the things that people have been talking about today um, in a way that we think makes it easier for non-security people to use correctly. So the first thing you can do, the first thing that you wanna do is kill all the red lines that I had on my slide before. We don't wanna run things as root. Most things don't actually need to run as root usually, so why do we do it? Well, let's not do that. I can run uh, the ID program very creatively. If I run it under Minigel, I can drop root I, UID and group ID and just run it as my normal user. And your reaction at this point should be not being impressed. Because sudo can do this. Sudo can do this very, very easily. And it's okay, you should tell me that. But my reply is gonna be fine. If sudo can do that, why does my Ubuntu workstation in 2016 look like this? There's no answer. The reason for that, there is an answer for that. The answer for that is that it's not e as easy as saying, oh, I'm just gonna not run as root. Because if you try to not run Bluetooth, P, uh, Bluetooth T as root, it will complain. Because why? Because it needs a certain uh, amount of root permission to set up your Bluetooth interface. And that is where capabilities come in. So capabilities are a way to partition the permissions that are usually allowed by root in a way that you can grant specific subsets of that functionality directly to a process without granting the whole functionality to that process. For example, I'm gonna keep picking on Bluetooth T. Um, Bluetooth T needs permissions to configure a network interface, but that shouldn't give it permissions to, for example, reboot the system or mount things. So what we're doing here is that, is that an example, but it actually, it's using the same capabilities mask as Bluetooth T. That Capabilities mask essentially means give this process uh, the permission to administer interfaces and to open raw sockets. 
It's CapNet admin and CapNet raw. Um, and as we can see, if we run cat under minigel in this case, and we look at what its capabilities mask look like, well, we're, they look exactly like what we set up. And now, when we combine capabilities with UID changing or, or root dropping, then we end up in a situation in which our system, or in this case, a Chrome OS system, looks like this. Everything that's exposed to the network is not running as root. Now, it's not completely deprivileged because it, most of these things, DHCP CD and WPA supplicant and Bluetooth D, do need a small amount of permissions to set up the interface that they control. But it's one thing to be able to reconfigure an interface, and it's a significantly different thing to be able to remount a file system, or to reboot the system, or to do any of the other things that a full root user will be able to do. So Minijail allowed us, in Chrome OS, to essentially take a system in which most things were running as root, and turn it into a system in which most things are not running as root, and essentially try to follow the principle of less uh, least privilege and just only get access to the things that they need. Yes? So is it not somewhat aesthetic because if DHCTD was already using capabilities properly, the fact that it was not as good, it didn't have any more capabilities than you're already here? Yes, but most things don't, unfortunately. Also, it would have to drop things from its bounding set, too. But yes, uh, most, uh, most programs, if, if I go back to my PS output, if you list the uh, allow capabilities for most of those things, they're not dropping anything, essentially. Um, so we want to kind of want to get to this situation in which things are not running with privilege, cannot gain extra privilege. Um, but this is not really all that we can do, or all that we want to do, because even though this, these programs don't have access to root functionality, they still mostly have access to the entirety of the kernel API. And the kernel is a really big piece of software, and it has a lot of lines of code and a lot of bugs. As Case was mentioning this morning, there's always going to be bugs. So even though the system or the program, in this case, any of these programs might not be able to directly, for example, mount a new file system or remount a file system because they don't, no longer have root permissions, they might still try to exploit kernel bugs because they have full access to the kernel API. But at the same time, if these programs were never expected to mount anything, well, they probably should not have access to the mount, the mount system call at all. And some people might know where I'm going with this. And where I'm going with this is seccomp. So the next logical step, after you've made sure that the kernel will not allow functionality to be, be available to these processes, is also to remove any access to the system calls from these processes. And the reason to do that is because even though um, a, a program that's running without root privileges, if it tried to call mount on something, Eventually, mount will say, no, actually, you don't have like capsys admin, so I'm not going to allow you to do any mount anything. Um, there's a lot of code that runs be before the kernel actually returns any reasonable thing to the user. And every single line of code that runs at that point is one opportunity for a bug to allow you to do stuff with the kernel that you were not allowed to. Um, so seccomp is a way to essentially give to the kernel a decision tree that tells the kernel which syscalls should be allowed for this process and which syscalls should not. Um, there's a line on proc self status that shows uh, if seccomp is enabled. In this case, we can use Minigil to set up a policy, in this case on cat, uh, that essentially looks something like this. Uh, the policy language that we have in Minigil is somewhat ftrace inspired um, because of historical artifacts. Um, but we only need nine system calls for CAT to work. And I've lost count, but there's probably how many? 350 system calls right now in the Linux kernel, something like that. So we don't need to expose 350 minus nine system calls to a program that doesn't need them. Um, Sitcom runs on syscall entry, so there's literally no syscall-specific code 
that gets reached by a possibly untrusted or malicious pro program if the second decision tree uh, doesn't allow it. So in this, by combining uh, non root running plus capabilities plus second, we end up in a situation in which the pro process really cannot do anything else besides what they were actually meant to do. And CAD works. Like those nine system calls are essentially everything it needs. Fine, CAD is a very simple program. But even the second uh, policy for the Chrome render, which is probably one of the most complex pieces of software that it can put inside SecComp, probably shaves off more than 50% of, of the syscalls, 50, five zero, syscalls that are available to any Linux process. So like, there's a lot of stuff there that code that's either potentially malicious or dealing with untrusted input definitely doesn't need. And by making it accessible for non-security developers, we actually got people from outside our, our security team writing the policies themselves, which it's to us, at least given the size of the security team versus the size of the full engineering team, the only way we could realistically achieve uh, a situation in which most of the, uh, the software in the system was running with reduced privilege. Um, now, the way this works and the, way, the reason why this looks as tight as it looks is because um, when we sandbox dynamically linked programs, we actually apply most of the sandboxing techniques after, in the process that's supposed to be sandboxed. Um, Minigel interposes a very small loader for dynamically linked programs using the LD preload environment variable. And this loader will inter intercept the, the, libc, the libc loading function, which is libc star main. And it will use that to find the location of the real main function, which is over there. And it will essentially enter the mini jail right before calling the real main function. And there's a very important reason, there's two important reasons for this. Reason number one is lib the libc will do a lot of stuff when preparing the runtime for a normal Linux binary. And we don't necessarily want to have to allow all those things in our policy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that libc will do, but the actual program, once it's executing its own code, won't need to do. So by loading Minigel, by entering the Minigel, by applying sandboxing right here, we don't need to put a bunch of syscalls that glibc will use, but the program won't use in the syscall filtering policy. Now, if you craft a a malicious ELF executable, there will be code executed by that ELF executable before any of this happens. Um, our vision with Minigel and Chrome OS in general and, and process on Android is usually we're more worried about trusted programs, that is tr programs compiled by us, dealing with untrusted input rather than completely untrusted programs that are given to us in binary form. So this works. And the fact that we can apply sandboxing right before main and not right after fork means that we can exclude a bunch of things from our allowed policy that libc needs, but we or the program doesn't need. There's another reason why we need to do uh, this preloading trick. And the reason for that is this is how capabilities are inherited after exec or over exec VE. And if you notice, if all the, the, the P's are process capabilities and the F's are file system capabilities. Now, if you don't have file system capabilities enabled, all the F's are gonna be zero. It's very easy to see that if all the F's are zero, then all the primes are gonna be zero. Because there's an and, there's an or with two ands at the top. If the two things in red are zero, then the two ands are zero and the or is zero. If F, zero, if F effective is zero, obviously the, that will be zero. And inheritable doesn't, doesn't uh, matter for permitted or effective unless uh, those Fs are zero. So we're essentially left with a situation in which the only way for capabilities to be 
be able to apply or be used over XXV, which is what, kind of what you want. You want a, a, a loader or a launcher that launches you into a, a, a sandbox container. Um, the only way to do that is using file system capabilities. But file system capabilities are tricky because they allow programs to um, gain new runtime capabilities. And you might want to have a system in which there's no way for anything in there to ever gain new capabilities. You, you might want, because it's easier, it's easier to reason about a system in which processes can only shed capabilities but never gain them. That, that makes it a lot easier to reason what any process can ever do on the system. So we're essentially left with a situation in which we can either accept to have a system in which processes can gain capabilities as well as shed them, or a system in which you can never gain capabilities because there's no file capabilities, but nothing, capabilities will never be able to survive an exec V. And that's not really um, an ideal situation. We would like a situation in which capabilities are preser preserved again, uh, over exec V, but there's no way to gain them. There's only ways to shed them. And obviously, we're not the only people who notice this. Everybody who's tried to use capabilities to do anything useful has noticed this. So eventually, um, a bunch of people figured this out, and eventually uh, Andy Lutomirsky submitted and landed ambient capabilities, which essentially work the way you kind of want capabilities to work. They can be inherited across XXV, and process can drop them, but unless fast, fast, uh, file capabilities are enabled, you can never gain new, new, uh, new capabilities, which makes a lot of sense. You essentially want to have a process, a bunch of process trees started by init in which you give processes a small set of capabilities which you think they need, and if they don't need them, they can drop them, but nothing can ever gain new capabilities. And when you're in that situation, reasoning about your system becomes a lot easier, um, which is kind of cool. All right, so that's, this is one case, I think, in which user space kind of needed kernel developers to change something in a way that made this, the, the kernel security primitives significantly or, or even possible to use. Um, what, what we learn with Minigel is sometimes uh, when we try to use, combine all this, the security functionality provided by the kernel and, and use it in like a Chrome OS or an Android, sometimes things don't quite gel the way you would want to use them when you're not only dealing with uh, the security team, but like the security team is working with a significantly bigger team of engineers that might not necessarily have security training. You want to make things easier for them because you can accomplish a lot more when the whole team is helping rather than we have three security engineers that are trying to keep everything from um, going crazy. However, and uh, there were some allusions to this in previous talks, sometimes code, it's not expecting to, Whenever a program acts as a resource, you kind of have two possible answers if you don't want to grant that resource, right? You can either say no, which is kind of what we've been talking about. Capabilities will, will cause some system calls to return EPIRM, and second will cause some syscalls to return EPIRM. Sometimes the code is not prepared to receive an error. So you have another option, which is you return a dummy object. And that's kind of how I think about namespaces. Namespaces allow us to uh, virtualize or separate certain pieces of functionality and allow uh, the kernel to return essentially, not dummy, but like kind of fake objects in uh, replacement of real objects. And that's kind of cool because it makes it easier to port random software, third-party software that we might want to run securely on our systems uh, without having to completely do like open heart surgery on the code and changing everything. So we, in it, we actually implemented, it was kind of cool that um, James had his, his list of namespaces, because it allowed me to uh, prove that all of them are implemented in Minigel, which I didn't know, they, they keep adding namespaces, so we sometimes kind of keep up. But all of them are implemented in Minigel, now I know. Um, the one that we use the most are PID namespaces, because it's always a good guarantee to know that the process that you're running will not be able to uh, exploit or gain privileges horizontally by exploiting other processes on the system. It might try to go through the kernel, and we'll have SecCom to deal with that, and all of Casey's work uh, leading the kernel self-protection project to deal with that, but we want to prevent the process from exploiting horizontally. Now, it's not easy to necessarily talk to other processes when they're running as a different UID, but 
that's, that code has bugs. And like the ptrace check to avoid ptracing other processes has had several bugs in the past. So it's a lot easier when the kernel will not even allow you to see the other processes. So Minijo will also allow you to create uh, pid namespaces. It works very similar to um, the uh, NSEnter uh, program in this case. But the value to us in this case is that it does what NSEnter does, but it also does what CapShell does, and it also allows you to apply a second policy on it. So we have one single binary that essentially allows us to use every single sandboxing and containment primitive available in the Linux kernel at the same time. And that has proved uh, invaluable for people on our teams who don't necessarily have security training to be able to use these primitives. Um, so this is what PS will look like if you run it inside a PID namespace, which makes sense because it's a PID namespace. So the only processes that are gonna be seen are the ones that are inside the namespace. But there's obviously a trick here. You might expect only PS to be inside the namespace, but that's kind of tricky because uh, the same way that any system has a init process that is responsible for launching every other process, but also by, for reaping their processes, well, each PID namespace has to have an init-like process to reap all the dead processes inside the namespace. Those processes do not get reparented to in it outside of the namespace. But we wanna run processes inside the PID namespace that don't necessarily know how to be in it. So Minijo will support launching a very small init-like process as PID1, so that way we can run things inside the namespace that might not expect being in a, in a PID namespace. Now, PS is not a very complex piece of software. It essentially just runs, uh, it just reads slash proc. Um, so this, the previous invocation, if you instead, instead of uh, doing PS, you list slash proc, it will kind of look the same way, right? It has to look the same way because PS is just listing slash proc. Now, how does this work? The, the way this works is uh, when you enter a new PID namespace, if you want slash proc to represent the new PID namespace, you need to remount slash proc. Slash proc will always show the state of the system tied to the PID namespace that's, uh, uh, that is assigned to the process that mount in slash proc. So if you are in a new PID namespace, you want a process inside that namespace to remount slash proc so that instead of listing everything outside of the namespace, it only lists things inside the namespace. And the best way to do this, at least for us, was to use mount namespaces. So essentially, if in Minijail, usually the use of PID namespaces always requires entering a new name, a mount namespace at the same time, which allows us to remount proc without modifying the parent's mount situation. Um, you could also trut and mount proc inside the trut, but we already have namespaces, so might as well use all of them. Um, James also showed this. Um, I don't really care if the identifiers are long or not, but sometimes I wanna know if things actually got put in the namespace that I expected, or at least a different one. So that's what I use this, uh, the numbers for. Uh, in this case, it's very easy to see that they're different. I mostly want them to be different. Um, even if they're not the most useful identifiers uh, right now. And now, it is, it is user namespaces, that we, we might have security concerns about them, but they are, um, they are what makes, essentially ties everything together, and the, the two key properties for us and for everyone is the fact that I'm, up until today, it is not a coincidence that all my command lines had a pound sign before Minigel. All of these things, these things were actually run as root. And until we implemented user namespaces, Minigel itself would run as root, and it would generate a bunch of non-root process trees on the system. Um, but we had a lot of questions from people on, inside Google that wanted to use Minigel in situations in which they didn't have root privileges. And obviously this didn't just happen with Minigel. It happened with containers as well. And, it, and user namespaces kind of tie all these things together. So the same way that you can use NSEnter, this is kind of what it looks like with Minijail. Um, that's my user ID on my Linux workstation. Um, and this has allowed us to start using Minijail in a bunch of situations, especially in like build systems and fuzzing infrastructure. There's a, a really big fuzzing cluster that Google uses on Chrome and Android. We call it a cluster fuzz. Um, and we use Minijail to essentially sandbox 
any, a bunch of untrusted, uh, non-trusted binaries that we want to subject to our fuzzing. And we wanted to be able to run this without, uh, without root. But sometimes, you need to run things that expect to be root inside the container, like Android. Android in it expects to be root. We are going to lie. We're going to be like, oh, you're just root inside the container. But we need to be able to allow Android in it to mostly do most of the things that a, a normal system, normal in it, would try to do as root. And this is mostly what the system looks like. There's a lot of boxes there. But essentially, uh, we bind bound a few things to make sure that when we run slash init, which is Android init, it's the init pro program used by Android, it has everything it expects in the locations it expects. And then it will actually just start a bunch of processes that happen to be the way Android works. And everything mostly just works because of the magic of namespaces. Um, the two big modifications that are done to the Android system to make this work is that input events are plumbed in using uh, it, in, are plumbed into the Android system instead of uh, being read by the system directly, which is what allows you, allows you to click on the Android window and have those things work. And graphic buffers are piped out using uh, FDs. So essentially, textures are written to FDs, and then the textures are composed outside of the container. But apart from those two things, there's no other modifications to the system require to run Android on Chrome OS, which is pretty cool. To me, this is pretty awesome. Um, thanks to the magic, again, of containers, we can let most things happen unmodified, which would have never been possible without something that, instead of denying a request from a process, just returns something that's kind of like the right thing, but not exactly the right thing. And it's super cool. I, it it kind of solves a bunch of problems in Chrome OS. And it also means it, it was most of the, mostly the driving force for Minigil to gain uh, the last bit of container functionality, mostly related to user namespaces. And it mostly looks like this. Um, these are all Minigil API calls. And we essentially said all containers. There's C groups, con C groups uh, namespace is missing there. Um, we set up the UID and group ID maps that James mentioned. And we do use pivot root, which I didn't have time to explain in more detail. It's kind of like shrewd, but easier to reason about. And we essentially just run Android in it. We just execute one binary, but it's inside a container that has everything set up correctly, and everything just kind of works, which is cool. And almost kind of out of time. So important acknowledgments. I didn't write this. I, I wrote a big chunk of it, but not all of it. Will Drew rewrote the initial version of Minigel, and Ellie Jones rewrote it in C. Dylan Reed uh, wrote a big chunk of the container stuff, and the Chrome OS team contributed a bunch of other uh, container stuff. Lee Campbell wrote the ELF parser that we use to know whether we can use our LD preload trick. And Case Cook, over there, um, reviewed a lot of code. Like, I haven't really been able to find anyone else. Google has a very strong code review culture, so you kind of need someone to review your code before you land it. And, like, nobody really knows about this, but Case does. So I'm like, sorry, Case. Another seal your way, and this is probably like number 100. It is what it is. Um, we use, we use uh, Minigel a lot. It's, it's shipped from the beginning on Chrome OS. It's going to be used on Android uh, starting with uh, 7.0 with Nougat, uh, mostly for SecComp. And it is used to implement Android and Chrome OS. Uh, and there we go. You can clone it. You can compile it. You can use it. Um, PSD licensed. It lives in the Android um, googlesource.com because it's mostly where we develop it the most. Um, it works. The, the executable will work on any Linux system. It will, it will work on Android systems. It will work on Chrome OS. It probably will work on Windows 10 if you install the weird Linux compatibility <laughs> thing. Maybe not. I don't really know. I haven't tried. I've seen only one Windows laptop in this room so far. So if you want to try, be my guest. I would love to know. Um, and that's our mailing list. Uh, there's not a lot of people there because we haven't really. There's a bunch of mini jail forks on GitHub, which is totally fine because it is BSD. Um, we've actually, some of them actually, some people actually work at Google and they maintain external mini jail forks. We've uh, very 
successfully asked them to contribute back some of the improvements that they made. Um, we're trying to not be so, uh, I don't know, to be a little bit more, um, uh, to kind of guide development a little bit better and not have people just have to do random forks or to, to improve functionality. So send questions, I'm subscribed, happy to answer. And yeah, that was Mini Joe. Questions? No questions? No hands? Are you going to be supporting security modules? That's a good question. Um, so far, this, is, this kind of came up, this same, a similar discussion came up when we were porting Mini Joe to Android and just kind of understand how we fit with SA Linux. Um, right now, I see them as very orthogonal kind of approaches. Um, so the answer is not tomorrow. But uh, my view on Minigel is that it should do what people think it's useful because that's the whole point. It's a, it's a helper tool. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't care what goes in. As long as it makes sense, I want Minigel to be useful. So if it, it actually, it did come up in some contexts in which it would be useful to be able to use Minigel to launch a, a process on Android specifically and set up SL Linux at the same time. Because right now, that would be kind of hard slash impossible. So yeah, maybe. Why not? We should do it. <laughs> I don't know. All right. I think we're good. Over there. So we do for second uh, capabilities are usual uh, capabilities. We, there are not that many of them, so we mostly done them by hand. Um, but there is a script in the Minigel source code uh, repository that will take an S trace output, and many of them actually, and compile a second policy for this language that will order the syscalls the right way. It will make sure that the policy is consistent. Like if you have, it will, it will, if you have like MMAP and your architecture actually exposes MMAP and MMAP2, it will put both in them. Uh, it will make sure that the, um, yeah, it will make sure that the right system calls are, are added. Um, it will make sure that architectural, like architecture stuff works correctly. So essentially we kind of compile all of this logic into that Python script. And like make sure that like a basic execution environment kind of works and things like that. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>